trauma that that brings. But the athletes need to play and they need to recover, yeah. and and that's okay. not an easy thing to do after okay. you play a five hour you match. Got me, you, you, you got me on that one because I'll go with you on that. Now, what, what about Maria Sharapova? You know, the, she returns to playing tennis in the in the Open. Um, some people thought that maybe she got a little um, little extra. Uh, Consideration to play uh, in the main uh, main at Arthur Ashe Stadium. What, what, what were you thinking when you were watching? So she was on a she was on basically a steroid suspension for 15 months. Right. She came back earlier this year. She was eligible to come back for the French Open in May. The French Open denied her a wild card. Wimbledon, the major immediately after the French, was going to grant her a wild card into qualifying, but she ended up being injured and had to pull out. The U.S. Open granted her a full wild card, uh, which, which I understand. You know, every, I thought that, you know, he, he, you know what you say what you want about Maria Sharapova, but a lot of people who don't know tennis know Maria Sharapova, and sometimes you you want those people watching your matches and not just the hardcores. So yeah, I, I have um, no it problem makes for a with better that. tournament with her in it. Yes, I agree. The where she ruffled some where she ruffled some feathers is that they consistently put her on Arthur Ashe court, which is a, there's an intrinsic advantage to to being on center court, to knowing your your dimensions, to knowing that you're going to play because if it rains they put the roof up. Right. Good some point. of some there you know there were some other much ballyhooed players. Yelena Ostapenko won the French Open. She's playing on court 17. Wozniacki's playing on court five. She's been number one in the world. So it ruffled some feathers that, you know, you have someone who, you know, is viewed in the locker room as a cheat, and she's getting preferential treatment because of her popularity. You can understand both sides. Oh, yeah, right. I can. I yeah. can. And did, didn't Wozniacki have something to say about that early on? She did. Her timing was bad because she got upset in the second round, and <laughs> she, she spent the better part of her press conference talking about Sharapova, which seemed a little off, but... So she came off like a sore loser, but yes, yeah, she did have some things to say. Well, that's um, that's understandable. Yeah, but I mean, the other the other way of looking at it is, and and you know, I'm not going to make excuses for Simone Halep, but obviously, as as what was she, the second or third seed, she's not expecting the wild card that she faces in the first round to be somebody who is, who's been a top five player in the world. It was a terrible draw for Simone Halep. It was unfair to Simone Halep, but it sort of is what it is. Not only did she have to play Sharapova, but Sharapova had never lost to Halep in her life. She was six in a lifetime. Yeah. So on top of getting a champ, you know, a five-time major champion as a wild card, you also have somebody who has your number. Yeah, and, and, and I mean that was just it was, that part of the draw was again. I mean, it, it gave people a reason to complain about the whole the whole process of of of, uh, of this of the draw and the seating and i know i know that stuff is done kind of randomly but obviously Halep was was kind of the big loser in in this whole situation and and through through no real fault of her own and if i'm not mistaken she took the high road i don't think she yes. did a lot of complaining about it but um, it did. gave the tournament a boost right from the beginning that you got Halep sharapova on center court First night, Arthur Ashe Stadium. It, you know, it sort of got the tournament going right away for me, which was a good thing. Yeah, definitely. Well, you know, it's, it's funny as a person who's not a you know a big tennis watcher. I'm watching on Wednesday night, and I go outside for a minute. It's pouring out. Meanwhile, in Flushing, they have. I didn't realize the, the roof. The roof was on, and I'm like, oh wow, because it was pouring in, in where I live. Uh, so pouring everywhere. <laughs> I was like, wow. Yeah, you know, I didn't even think about the you know the, how important that that roof is. For the, uh, especially for uh, a tournament like the U.S. Open, bigly was, important. Oh, it's just, just it's incredible. I was, I was, and they're going to add a roof on Armstrong, you know, in a year or two, also. Oh, so they are. Oh, wow. Stadiums yeah. with a roof. It, it, I mean, it really does make a big difference, just in terms of, of getting more matches. And obviously, you can't play on the outer courts, but just to be able to get a few more matches in under the roof, and 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 you know, kind of like you said before, just you know, you're going to play. Yeah, and, and it really does favor the better players because if you're playing on Arthur Ashe Stadium, you know, the rhythm of a, of a Grand Slam is you're playing every other day. Right. If you are, again, Yelena Ostapenko and you get rained out on court 17, now you have to come back and play the next day and then again the next day to stay on rhythm. So yeah. now you're playing back-to-back days, whereas the stars and the superstars just get to stay in their rhythm and play every other day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well... Okay, well, they've earned it. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Dan, talk uh, talk a little bit more about the the men's draw and 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 how things broke for Nadal. Oh, he has no complaints. <laughs> um, I know. <laughs> he he got uh, he got almost a walkthrough. I mean, I hate to say that he 
he didn't have to beat anybody ranked better than 24th, which was Del Potro. By the time Del Potro played Rafa, he was done. He had played a five-setter against Dominique Team, where he was down two sets to none and came back, then had to follow that up by playing Federer. So Del Potro had one good set in him. He won the first set 6-4, and then Rafa just beat him down after that. Mm-hmm. And in the final, he got a 31-year-old first-time finalist, Kevin Anderson, who's also been in and out of injuries. Um, frankly, the stage was too big for Anderson and Rafa. That was a non-competitive match yesterday. So Rafa had a pretty smooth draw. Um, he got a guy, a 19-year-old up-and-coming kid named Rublev in the quarterfinals who also wasn't ready for the moment. So Rafa uh, has no complaints about what he was left to deal with. Well, that's, that's sometimes how you win a title. Hey, that's how <laughs> and like goes. you said, you the men's field had been so, so depleted and decimated that, that you know, it just it made it that much easier for him. Yeah, and again, the timing of, of the Murray withdrawal was important because the two best seeds on the other side of the draw, one of them is an up-and-coming 20-year-old German named Alexander Zverev, who was the right. fourth seed, who I think going into the tournament was the second or third favorite in Las Vegas to win the U.S. Open. He lost in the second round. Yeah, he got a lot of, a lot of publicity before the, the tournament started. I saw his name a lot in, in the preview articles. He's going to be really good. He, he already won a Masters 1000, which is um, the highest level of tennis tournament that's not a major he won one of those i think he's the youngest player ever to win a masters 1000 event hmm. so he's he's earned his accolades but he didn't have a very good grand slam season and maybe next year will be better for him than this year that's, that's, that's somebody somebody, to, somebody to look for yeah you gotta you gotta have new people coming in because you get you get bored with federer and nadal and and murray and, and you know and djokovic you know it's, it's like oh these guys gonna win again but that's know? that's the state of men's tennis right now <laughs> It's it's a it's a good and a bad. Yeah. You know, you, it's what it's what flocks people to the televisions for the semifinals and finals, and it's what bores us until the semifinals and finals that you don't really feel like there's a viable threat to to go up and win the tournament. Right. Yeah, I was watching the ESPN coverage, and I'm I'm used to the CBS coverage because you know they they did it so well for so many years. It just it was just different having a game uh, the, the finals on at four o'clock on a Saturday. I expected maybe a prime time thing or something. That surprised me as well. I agree. Yeah. And uh, they, 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 but they had college football on, so maybe that was more important. <laughs> not, <laughs> in not in New York. <laughs> not in New York. Not in New York necessarily. Yeah, but yeah. We're, we're not a college football in, town in Nebraska. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We know that they don't they don't care about tennis there. <laughs> Dan, I want to thank you for joining us, talking about the U.S. Open. Uh, do you have a website or uh, anything to people want to contact you at? No, I don't. No, okay. I just I'm happy to talk about it. I'm happy okay. to get people into it. I'm an avid player, mm-hmm. and I also mm-hmm. love to watch. Great stuff. Uh, much appreciated, Dan. That's Dan DeRosalia. Thanks, Dan. Uh, former Thank you, writer at Newsday, uh, now independent tennis observer, talking about uh, the U.S. Open, which is always a fun thing. Uh, have you ever been down there, Tim? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, not covering it, but just like walking around. And, Both. Oh, okay. Because uh, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's, it, it's, it it's also really? a lot of people. Yeah, uh, it, yeah. It's it's a big crowd there. Um, but. It, it's it's a lot of fun. It's it's a it's a good event. I, I will say, if, if anybody planning on going there, uh, definitely bring a full wallet. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> it's uh, the food. The food's a bit pricey, uh, but that, uh, yeah, a lot a lot of fun though. But you know, it's funny because for two weeks, the money they make covers their entire budget for the rest of the year, yeah. and they do a lot of stuff with New York tennis. Yeah, um, not just the stadium there and the courts, but in other parts of New York, you know, in, in Harlem and Queens and stuff like that. Yeah, so. there's. I mean, it's the the tournament obviously um, brings in a lot of cash, but there there's a lot of stuff that needs to be done and a lot of stuff that that the UST does, especially in the New York area. Yeah, they, uh, you know, it's, uh, you're right. It is expensive. I mean, you know, that's just real expensive. Yeah. Well, that's it's the way it's New York, everything's expensive. We're going to take a break right now. You're listening to 90.3 WHPC from the Press Box. I am Rob Leonard. He is award-winning sports writer Tim Leonard. And if you'd like to call in with a question, 516-572-7440. Is this really the most interesting thing on the radio right now? Not anymore. Uh, what's happening? FM Punk. That's what's happening. Who are you exactly? I'm Riley Hogan, the host of FM Punk. Riley Hogan? I'm too anti-conformist for a cool DJ name. Tune in to FM Punk for blistering punk rock 
fury. Everything from Ramones to Gorilla Biscuits to Moss Icon to Nails. I play whatever I want. So whether you're into grindcore or old school emo, there's something here for you. That's cool and all, but what are you doing in my car? What aren't I doing in your car? Stop that! FM Punk, Thursday nights at 11 on The Voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. Essential Ladies is back. Join me, Ron Stevens, Saturdays at 10 a.m. for two hours of music, trends, and sounds of the decade of Michael Jackson, Madonna, Patty Shoulders, and Dynasty. It's the 80s. Take the trip back to the future as we play the classic hits. Essential Ladies, Blast Those Walkmans, and Boombox Radios, Saturday mornings at 10 on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. If you were getting married to whoever, you have ungodly amount of money. I know where I would get married. Yeah, where? Disney World, 100%. Oh my God, are you kidding me? <laughs> no, but like I'd rent out the whole park. So okay. your vows on Space Mountain. And then there's a better place to have the reception. Beauty and the Beast, they have a giant recreation of the ballroom. I feel like that's, that's awesome, the perfect actually. place for a ballroom reception. But... Will there be a candle who will sing to me? In a of course concert? there will is- be. What do you think? I'm like, <laughs> I'm going half on this. Yeah, that's fair enough. Our vows will be exchanged by the fairy godmother. Like, it's going to be okay. legit. That's fair enough. Come on. Nassau Morning Madhouse. Weekday mornings from 7 to 9. Yeah, 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 yeah. On the voice of Nassau Community College. 90.3 WHPC. Welcome back to From the Press Box right here. I'm the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. Good stuff with Dan there, Tim. Yeah. U.S. Open. Always good to branch out a little bit and yeah, bring some different sports to the show. Yeah, man. Especially with, with somebody who's an expert on the subject. Definitely, definitely. So it wasn't bad. So we talk football. We uh, Just quickly, I just want to bring a couple of things up. Tony Romo started his new career as lead analyst for CBS Sports. I feel bad because why? Because Phil Simms isn't that guy anymore. You know? well, and Tony Romo had no had no what inkling of <laughs> of having any talent on being a, a, an announcer. It's like, no, what? Say yeah, it. You know. <laughs> you so. know. I tell you what, though, Tony Romo was pretty much universally praised for his work on the Raiders Titans game yesterday. Uh, he brought a lot of a lot of good good quality analysis, uh, some great anticipation. Several times called plays before they happened, which you know, that's obviously due to the fact that he was very recently a player and well, still yeah. recognizes a lot of what's going on. But um, I, I I forget who it was from the network who made the comment, but they said that the the remark the responses on social media were overwhelmingly positive. And, and we all know that social media tends to be a pretty negative place. Oh, my God. Yeah. So the fact that, that people were, were talking positively about Tony Romo on, on you know places like Twitter and, and Facebook and Instagram uh, just tells me that, all right, hey, he, you know what? First time out anyway, he did a nice job. Yeah, so I'll good give, for him. I'll give him credit. You know, I, I, I'm a big Phil Sims guy. You know, I, I, I like Phil Sims not just as a quarterback but as an announcer. He's always fair, always – He's tough but fair. You know, he's one of those guys. Uh, I was very, you know, I, I like him. And by yeah. the way, brother, you know, the, you know, we maybe should uh, get a tape out. There might be a job opening at WFAN. Uh, I'm ready. Be be uh, Boomer's uh, sidekick. Boomer and Leonard. Yeah, Boomer and Leonard. Yeah, that's me. That's me. Not you. Why not? 
Come on. Boomer, no, had, though, to carry, Boomer had to carry the other I have guy. to say, uh, uh, WHPC alumni Brandon Tierney, whether he admits he's from here or not, uh, was uh, Boomer's guy on Friday. So There you go. Uh, congratulations to Boomer. Opening the door I mean, for me. I mean, for uh, Us. Brandon. Yeah, I, <clears throat> we can do that. So anyway, just to let you know. Also, uh, just a quick thing. Yes. Gary.